something is, and that's what we're looking for. So, divergence of j equals zero is Kirchhoff's law. So what does it mean? Divergence is a measure of the difference between what goes in and out of an infinitesimal volume. So divergence equals zero means nothing's being lost or gained. So if you get any volume in your conductor, divergence being zero means as the volume shrinks to zero, the, the amount of current going into it is the same as the amount of current going out. In other words, inside your bucket of salty water, there's no wires for current to get out. Any current going into any little bit of it has to go out again. So in a, an electric circuit, you'd say in the absence of any sources of current, all the current flowing in one wire has to come out to the other wires that are attached to it. And that's Kirchhoff's law in circuits. Current in equals current out. So in the absence of sources, and our sources are only on the exterior, we have this Kirchhoff's law. And then we put this all together, we've got divergence of sigma grad u is equal to zero. Now you see why I didn't really care about the minus sign. Um, and that's an equation for u, which is the scalar that we're looking for. And so this is Ohm's Kirchhoff's law in electric circuit terms. It's a continual version of Ohm's Kirchhoff's law. It says there's no sources in the interior. Okay. So let's just remind ourselves what this actually means in, in components. It means that um, so the the gradient is du by dx one, du by dx two, du by dx three. It's the gradient, u, and then each component is multiplied by the same sigma, that's meant to be a sigma, not a 6. And then we take the divergence, so in other words, of each of these components, we differentiate again. And the sum of that is 0. So, it's a second order partial differential equation. Um, it's got a coefficient in it, sigma. Sigma is a function of x as well. And uh, it looks very much like Laplace's equation. So for sigma equals 1, it's just Laplace's equation. Okay, so um, that's what's going on in the interior. There's one extra ingredient that we need for our forward model, which is what's going on at the boundary. So let's just remind ourselves what kind of equation this is. It's a second order, because there are two derivatives of the U, partial differential for you, right? Just like the Laplace's equation, but with an extra coefficient in. It's also elliptic, um, as well. Sigma is is strictly positive. In fact, um, so we've got something. We're assuming that there's no, say, air bubbles or something in our conductive fluid. Not really true of people, is it? We do sometimes have air bubbles in this. But um, there's, there's no point at which the conductivity is zero. Okay, so we're, we're assuming that, in which case, um, as long as this is bounded away from zero, actually, this is an elliptic equation. And really, probably all you know about that is that there are 
three commonly occurring types of partial differential equation in elementary courses, elliptic, parabolic and hyperbolic, and the elliptic one we meet is Laplace's equation, the, uh, and, and we also meet the hyperbolic equation, the wave equation, and the parabolic equation, the heat equation. And so you just generally think of those as being the archetypal three types of second order PDEs that you meet, and this is elliptic, in other words, very much like Laplace's equation. Solutions look and behave very much like the classes of me. Um, so, um, right, so we'll we'll see how this helps us in a moment. Um, and we're also considering the forward problem. In other words, sigma is assumed to be known, and then we'd solve for the voltage. That's the forward problem, the one that's solved by by nature. So. To get a unique solution to this, we have to apply some boundary conditions. Okay, because there's a very large number of solutions for that. And here are the common boundary conditions. Dirichlet. Boundary conditions, which are that u restricted to the boundary is equal to some value f. So let me set some kind of notation. Our body, possibly the earth or our bucket or our person, is called capital omega. The boundary is called curly d omega. It just means boundary of something. And so directly um, uh, that is actually an uh, The Dirichlet boundary conditions say that we specify the voltage at the boundary. Okay, so you could do that by covering it with electrodes and making sure you put a particular voltage on them. So, because we don't actually do that, because we never really completely cover something with electrodes. But that would be what a Dirichlet boundary condition means. Okay, and certainly if we specify that and we can specify whatever voltage we like, we can then solve this and the potential is uniquely defined. And of course that means that somehow in specifying voltage at the boundary, we've also chosen where Earth is. Okay, so that's one type of boundary condition. The other one, Neumann boundary conditions. So in this case, so what, what we do is you specify sigma times pu by dn, or this means moment, is equal to some function g. So um, n is the outward unit normal to the boundary. And so this means the directional derivative in the direction of the boundary. And in, in so in fact, it's the same as saying sigma grad u dot n is equal to q. So here's the normal. Uh, let's hope we don't have a corner on our body, because then you wouldn't know what the normal meant. For the moment it's a smooth boundary, so it has a well-defined normal. And so you can then understand what this means because sigma grad u is minus the current density at the boundary. And if we dot it with the outward normal, because of that minus sign that I so easily lose, um, that means that's the current going into the boundary. See what I mean? This is j, this is minus j, this is the outward normal, and one conventionally uses the outward pointing normal in mathematics and so this j is the current going in. In fact it's the current density on the surface going in. Right. Is that clear? Do you know? I don't know whether I, some people are nodding, some people are looking confused, but okay, so so that's where you want to think of this. So it's current going in. So we can specify the current going in, and that's more like what we're used to doing in EIT, because traditionally you get a device 
that applies a certain current to each electrode. That's not quite so obvious how you do that because, you know, if you go to the hardware store, you buy batteries that tell you how many volts they put in, not how many amps, right? So you actually have to make a circuit that delivers a specified current, current source. And it will do that effectively by adjusting the voltage to get the right current. Mm -hmm. And if you don't plug it onto anything, it will just go up as high a voltage as it can and then give up. So, so there's come some kind of electronics involved in this, but um, at least in medical EIT, you, you want to limit how much current you put in the people. So, so it's actually traditional to use current sources. Um, so you'd specify the current each electrode on the, ba on the boundary, and now we see that in between electrodes, and let me just break up my computer again because there is a picture of somebody wearing some electrodes in this document. So, there's somebody wearing an outrageous number of electrodes, uh, but you see it's not covering this entire body, and so where there are no electrodes, the current density is zero, there's no current going in or out. So, um, so if we knew the current on each of these electrodes and knew that there was no current in the rest of the body, we'd have specified this Neumann boundary condition G. Okay, so, so there's a subtlety. Um, that, in, in fact, what you specify on, the, on an electrode, the electrode has a, a thin resistive layer underneath it, um, especially you know, a layer of dead skin and some electrolyte and so on. And so, actually, there's some loss of drop of voltage going across that. It depends on the current. So, there's another boundary condition that's a kind of mixture of these two, called the complete electrode model which takes account of the um, contact impedance. I mean, that, that's fairly easy to describe, but, but I'm just going to ignore that for a moment. Okay. So, if you've got small electrodes, little point electrodes, you can just say, I knew I put a 10 milliamps into this electrode, and it's got negligible size. That's really just like applying a Neumann boundary condition. But as you go to the complete electrode model, the the pattern of the current density over the electrode is, is something that you care about. So interestingly, the geophysicists don't model electrodes, and medical and process EIT people do model the electrodes. Anyway, it's a slight digression, because here's the point. Usually, in, in any book on PDE, you'd, you'd specify Dirichlet boundary conditions, and then you say solve it, it's got a unique solution, everything works fine. Indeed, the solution depends in a nice way on the data. So it's changed the voltage a bit on the boundary, changes in the interior in a nice smooth way. Similarly, we can specify the current on the boundary. It's a little bit of a subtlety. Um, from Gauss's law, we do have to specify a current whose integral is zero on the boundary, because the current density has to integrate to zero, it's divergence is zero. Um, and so, of course, that's intuitively obvious. You can't, you know, put 100 milliamps in there and it not come out.